Welcome. Welcome to Possibility Project. We are a growing community of over 1,500 disruptive change makers across the U.S. reclaiming our power through meaningful sparks and connections and actions. So this is our 18th episode and we're now well into our second season. So if you missed any of our previous, previous episodes, we invite you to check them out on our website. Heather's gonna add that in the chat. And um, our episodes are also shared by our awesome um, podcast friend named Mickey Desai, who runs the nonprofit Snapcast. So we encourage you to check out all of his uh, postings and uh, where we're, Possibility Project is also featured there. So today we want to do quick introductions about ourselves and then we'll get you straight to Mallory Erickson, who's our featured speaker today, uh, talking about disrupting philanthropy and fundraising. So uh, today I want to use our Zoom introduction guidelines, which a previous guest, um, Nova Ren, Kai, and Kiwananda with Genesis Healing Institute has introduced to us. Um, and you're welcome to use them and access them. Um, so I will do my introductions first and I'll, um, in a couple minutes, um, take you through uh, a, a other introductions. So my name is Devin Davey. I'm the, one of the two co-creators of Possibility Project. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm coming to you from land that was kept and held sacred by the Ramatush and the Ohlone people uh, in San Francisco. And I honor the ancestral keepers of this land where I'm now living, and I honor their descendants um, who continue to breathe, breathe sacred life into our earth. So following that, I wanna share just, just a quick note on territory acknowledgements. They're one tiny small part of disrupting and dismantling colonial structures. And if you wanna learn more uh, about this, uh, we will share information uh, in the chat about land acknowledgement. So we also want to recognize and make a note that many of our guests are often um, presenting a US-based perspective, and we welcome all perspectives from other places and spaces. Just want to acknowledge that. Um, also, for anyone who may be differently abled um, uh, visually, I want to describe my physical person. So I'm a white woman with brown eyes and brown shoulder-length hair, and I have a white background with a red top on and a plant to my right, uh, a little green greenness in the screen. Um, also, thanks to Otter, we're going to be recording a transcript of today's conversation for folks to follow along uh, afterwards if needed. So. My name is Devin Davey. I'm a strategy consultant partnering with social entrepreneurs and networks by co-designing and implementing people and process approaches. And you can learn more about my work on my website that Heather's going to share. And I want to introduce my fabulous co-creator of Possibility Project. Um, Heather Hiscox is the CEO and founder of Pause for Change. And she works with philanthropic foundations and local governments to help them address challenges and pursue opportunities in less time using fewer resources while achieving greater impact. She's fantastic. Check out her website. And um, Heather and I started this project in March of 2020 when COVID hit the US with the dream of making this moment matter. We wanted to bring light to these conversations that we are having in small trusted groups in the dark corners of Zoom and um, wanted to bring to light the dysfunction that we were seeing in the social sector and really bring them to a socially scaled um, moment. And uh, we now have over 1500 community members, which is awesome. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is our 18th episode. Um, you can see these are our intentions um, with I just, just wanting to highlight the last one being examining our role in transformation, starting with ourselves. So we invite you to make a gift to help us pay for our speakers. Um, this is new this season, and um, we want to cover the costs for what it takes to make each episode possible. And so you can visit opencollective.com slash possibility project and um, make a contribution to fund our speakers. And with that, I want to introduce our fantastic featured speaker. I'm really honored to be hosting this episode. Um, and here on Possibility Project, we like to introduce our speakers differently. So before I turn over the mic to Mallory, I wanna share a little bit about what she does and then she's gonna tell us the story. So Mallory Erickson helps nonprofits raise more money from the right funders so that they can stop hounding people for money. So um, Mallory provides unique tools and helps nonprofits fundraise 
um, more from foundations, corporate partners, and individuals. And she's coached over a thousand fundraisers, which is amazing. Over a hundred um, folks in, in fundraising and philanthropy have joined this call today. And so we're just so honored to have you, Mallory. So tell us a story about yourself. <laughs> Fun well, story. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is a story about two-year-old Mallory, but that I was reminded, I thought about yesterday or on, on Mother's Day for the first time in a long time, which was that one of my earliest memories um, was when we had an inspector come to our old house and he let me, I was, I was about two, he let me and my imaginary friend who was named Karch because I had a speech impediment and that was how I said ketchup. Um, <laughs> he let me and Karch go underneath the house with him um, to like do the inspection. And I was just thinking like after kind of laughing about the story about me and Karch with my family, I was just thinking about like, why is that one of my earliest memories? Um, and I think I, when, as I think about it, I think it's just because he was so kind and I felt so special to get to do something like that and to bring my friend and, um, you know, just like those little moments of life sometimes that I think we've all, you know, grown to appreciate maybe more over this last crazy year. Um, and that I know so many of us are looking forward to again. Um, yeah, that's my weird random story of, of me and Karch to kick us off. <laughs> Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, and it's very fitting because you also have a two-year-old at mm -hmm. home, right? Yes. Yes. So we are anticipating whether or not she's going to have an imaginary friend and uh, and what that friend might be named. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for letting me put you on the spot there. And um, I just want to say a note about how we came to this topic, Heather and I, um, as former fundraisers in a past life in the social sector, um, we have learned a lot around what it feels like to be demoralized, to be dehumanized, to chase funds and be at the funder beck and call and work within a system where humanity isn't prioritized in a lot of ways. And so um, the status quo ways of fundraising we know are outdated and they're also ineffective. And so how do we do things differently? Um, today, we, we do want to honor the struggles that we're exploring and kind of facing and, and on the journey together on um, and with, uh, with each other. And we also want to talk about what this new era of fundraising looks like and so how we move from transactional to authentic connection um how we how we really just kind of flip these power asymmetries and fundraise differently and put humanity and, and um the needs of the work and the people that we're working with at the center um to create this new new era of fundraising so with that um i'm going to turn it over to you mallory and uh, thank you for being with us yeah, thank you for, for the honor of, um, of talking to all of you today. And I have slides and I'll probably go back and forth a little bit so we can see each other at the right times and talk to each other at the right time. So bear with me as I do my you know technological uh, flips around here. Um, but I, you know, I'll do a little intro in a second, but maybe before I even go in, into any kind of detail about what we're going to explore today, I just want to say like, who it is a hard moment right now. I mean, it has been a hard moment for a long time, but I think what I'm seeing and feeling from, you know, the fundraisers that I work with, I work with over 75 organizations right now, and it is just a particularly challenging time of how do we, as we're sort of coming out of the last 14 months, um, but there's all this change and energy and attention, you know, how do we sort of take some of the learnings from the last year apply them to that that were that were helpful in sort of the deep authenticity many of us built with our funders how do we take them moving forward um, and sort of blaze a new trail um, you know and a new path 
in the midst of just a really shifting environment in so many ways. And so if you are feeling scattered or heavy or any of those things, I just want to like welcome you into this space because you are just like everyone else I'm working with right now. And, um, and we're just going to, we're just going to ease into to these concepts together and really provide a space for folks to share and give feedback. And, um, you know, this is a really, a really safe conversation um, where we also, I also just want to say that we're not going to touch. This is a huge topic. This is a huge topic. And so we have carved out a piece of it for today. There's going to be a lot of resources at the end of some of the surrounding topics. And then to just know that there are, that it's not, um, you know, there will be other ways to sort of dive deeper into some of these different pieces, some of those with me, some of those with other, um, you know, amazing, amazing thought leaders in this space. So, okay. All right. Let's let's go in. Um, <laughs> so as I mentioned, my name is Mallory Erickson. I am so grateful to be with all of you today and really just so grateful for what you do. I love nonprofit leaders and I love fundraisers and um, I have spent my entire career here. And so I'm just grateful for you giving 90 minutes to come and talk about what disruption in this space looks like, what your, what your role can be or is in that and what the surrounding surrounding conversation um, is. We are, our agenda for today is sort of fourfold, <laughs> I guess you can say that, um, which is that we're going to have, we're going to just bring some kind of awareness into our current experience as fundraisers and, you know, what's been working, what's not. I'm going to talk a little bit about my kind of like signature framework around finding the right fundraisers. I'm going to go over this at a pretty high level, but I'll, I'll share where you can go if you want the kind of blueprint around it. Um, we're going to talk about how you engage the right funders with win-win alignment. So dismantling some of those power asymmetries and really, you know, coming to the table as a nonprofit with offerings, which you have many of um, in partnership with your, with your funders, and then for how we can raise more money by being confident, vulnerable, and authentic. A lot of organizations saw this and experienced this in 2020 because it sort of brutally required it of us. Um, and so there's a lot that we can, that we can learn from that um, and that we can take forward into how we continue to, to to nurture and collaborate and, um, and, you know, grow and sustain our organizations in, um, in powerful ways. Okay. Um, so just to give you a tiny bit of background about me and why it is that I'm even talking to you today. So I, like many of you probably on this call, became an accidental fundraiser. As I mentioned, I have spent my entire career in the nonprofit sector. I found myself promoted into a managing director role that came with big fundraising responsibilities and then into an executive director role that had big fundraising responsibilities. Um, and if you had asked me what my least favorite part of being an executive director was, I would have without a doubt said fundraising. And it was because it felt like this constant hustle and, and sort of like hamster wheel, but also because I just really didn't feel like I could be fully human and fully myself as a fundraiser. And so I, I always sort of show this slide um, to, to lighten the mood a little bit, um, but also just to like, I know I'm not alone here, right? Like we, we sort of, you know, I call it impact report fake, right? Like we feel this pressure or this sort of structure has been set up to make us feel this pressure about being, you know, perfect and having it all tied up with a bow. And in reality, we are tired and hustling and just trying to figure out how to make it work and wearing way too many hats and all of the different pieces. So I really like, honestly, kind of hit rock bottom with this and was like, I cannot keep doing this. I like, you know, was prioritizing my um, work over family and friends. And I developed chronic pain actually from the stress of running an organization and being in this rat race. And I kind of got to this moment where I was like, I cannot, 
I cannot do this anymore. Like, do I have to leave the nonprofit sector? Um, but something about that rock bottom moment kind of made me like think bigger or think about how I could change this to make it sustainable for me. Um, and that was really what helped me build my program, which is now called the Power Partners Formula. I have a course that's self-guided for organizations. I work with organizations one-on-one -on -one around it. But what really happened was in the midst of all of this, I was being certified as an executive coach. I was working with folks over at Stanford on um, behavior change and habit building, the folks at IDEO on design thinking, and something kind of just fused together in my brain at that time, like, wait a second, maybe all of the things I've been taught about fundraising that don't feel good, that aren't working for me, like maybe it doesn't have to be this way. And like, what if it doesn't? Like what might be possible if I actually break the mold? And because I was at that sort of rock bottom moment where like there was nowhere else to go, I was like, well, I might as well try. <laughs> and so I did. And, um, and not only did it dramatically change the results of my fundraising, but it really changed how I felt as a fundraiser and how I showed up as a fundraiser. And then the more and more that I shared those strategies with um, the folks around me, the more they, you know, wanted access to them and were like, yes, like, where is this conversation? And so, you know, that's sort of what, what brings me um, to you today. So, you know, <laughs> I show this image to a lot of people and they're like, oh my God, I've never related to a picture more, but like most to like a little graphic, right? But like most fundraisers I know feel like this, like that they have too many brain tabs and too many computer tabs open at every single moment. And on top of that, they often feel, you know, super like cringy and awkward most of the time. I just had a call with yesterday with a a uh, chief marketing officer of a huge company. Like you would think nothing scares this human. And he was telling me about how he, he sits on the board of an organization and they asked him to be the final speaker for their event that was actually going to make the ask. And he started, he's like, I, I think like I might throw up, you know, and here's someone who's spoken in front of hundreds and thousands of people. Right. And he was like, I did it, but I was like, am I going to throw up? Like, am I going to throw up before, you know? And I was like, Oh, dude, I have, <laughs> I full on have actually before a donor meeting. So you'd be probably like a lot of people. So like the, the, these feelings that we carry, right. They are universal, but there haven't been a lot of spaces to talk about them in. And if we don't talk about how we're feeling, then we actually can't like undo the pieces that are making them feel uh, us feel that way. Right. And so that's sort of like where this conversation comes from. And, you know, I just want to say like, the old school, like not only do we know that the old school fundraising strategies are broken because they aren't moving nearly enough money into the sector, but also because they're rooted in, you know, capitalism and white supremacy and patriarchy and unconscious bias. And I don't, as a sector, we have not taken the step back that's required. Like these fundraising strategies that are still out there, that are still running all of these trainings or that we're finding on all of these blogs, they were created and they worked, quote unquote, when the biggest fundraisers looked like this. And we just haven't let them go, right? Like, but, or like this, right? This is what fundraising used to look like. This is the history of what we're doing. And this is what has created the old school donor centric white savior philanthropy models, right? And we don't have time to go into the whole history of this here, but I, but I just do want to highlight that the sort of like white woman as volunteers for the needy narrative that was born out of capitalism and white supremacy and patriarchy and the fundraising models that have come as a result, like the narratives of, you know, that surround the 100% model or not wanting to pay for overhead or restricted versus unrestricted debate. All of that comes from this histo history 
of the nonprofit sector, right? So I just want to like kind of ground us in that as we're, because there are these conversations happening around us about breaking all of those other systems. And so often I've been like, okay, well, where's the, where's the conversation? Not just about philanthropy as a whole, which I think is happening in a lot of other ways and Possibility Project has had some great conversations around this too, but also like for us as the fundraisers, as the organizations, what is our, what is our role in this? So, you know, the, yeah, this is basically what I already said, right? The old, the times have changed, but fundraising training hasn't come, you know, caught up to that yet. Um, and so I want to, I'm going to start with something. And in a moment, I just want to sort of say, like, in a moment, I'm going to open up some opportunities for folks to share their own experience as fundraisers. So as I talk through this next concept, I want you to sort of keep that in mind if you are open to or wanting to share your own experience. Um, but as I mentioned a moment ago, you know, today we're talking about, like, as the fundraiser side, right? As the organization side, what is our role? What can our role be in disrupting the system? So the basis of my work, like the foundational basis of my work starts with awareness around our emotions, right? So as I said before, like if we can't tap into how we feel or talk about how we feel, then it makes it really hard to have conversations about the structures or the thoughts or the beliefs that are informing those feelings, right? So the very first way to start to shift how we show up as fundraisers is to bring awareness around our emotions, okay? And this is the big piece here. You know, I, I mentioned that I got certified as an executive coach and it was part of what fundamentally shifted the way that I fundraise. It was really around this. It was really around, okay, what are the thoughts? What are the beliefs that I'm holding that are affecting the way that I'm showing up? Um, I also just wanna say really quickly to interrupt myself that I'm not looking at the chat um, because I'm trying to stay focused on the content. Okay, so you guys just tell me, like, start to wave frantically if um, there's something I'm missing that I should be addressing. Um, I don't want you to think that I'm ignoring you because I'm not intentionally. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, okay, so awareness around emotions, and I also want to say, kind of before I before we dive into this actual framework, like what I'm going to talk to you about today these executive coaching principles are interwoven into this and to help you think differently, show up differently, fundraise differently. There are going to be some framework principles. There are going to be some coaching principles and all of these strategies and principles will improve the way that you fundraise by implementing them. But I am not one of those coaches that says everything is in your mind. Okay. No. Structural racism and discrimination in the nonprofit sector is a very real thing. And so I just want to name that because I think there is a lot of um, progress we can make by addressing and bringing awareness to what's happening in our heads and our beliefs and our thoughts and how we're showing up. But I don't want there to be sort of any misinterpretation that that is the only um, that is the only piece of this. This is one piece of this. Okay. So, um, I just want to give that, that caveat. Um, so, all right. So awareness. So how do you dive into this, this piece? So what I'm going to show you right now is called the cognitive behavior loop. So this is the idea that our beliefs and our thoughts inform how we feel and then ultimately how we show up. Okay. So I'm going to say that again. So our beliefs and our thoughts inform how we feel and ultimately how we show up. So if I said to you right now, fundraising is not stressful and don't just like click out of here for a second, right? But like fundraising is not stressful. Fundraising is just fundraising, right? What's stressful are the thoughts and the beliefs that we have about fundraising. And let me give you an example that doesn't relate to fundraisers. So you might be able to like have an entry point into this. A few years ago, I was talking to a group of students and parents about chemist about uh, test anxiety. And I said to the room, I was like, you know, chemistry is not stressful. And they were like, what are you talking about? Like, that's why we're here. And I was like, no, you know, chemistry is just chemistry. What's stressful are the thoughts and the beliefs that we have about chemistry, right? I did poorly on the last test, so I'm going to do poorly on this test. The teacher likes so-and-so better than me. I never understand science. I'm never going to get this. Those thoughts, those beliefs, that's actually where the stress 
about chemistry comes from. And the same thing is true about fundraising. So much of the stress and the anxiety that we feel about fundraising comes from our thoughts and beliefs. Not everything, but a lot of it. And the good news is that for that stuff, we can actually control it, right? And this was transformational for me. And this is what I see with my clients and the folks in my program. Like after they go through this lesson, they're just like, whoa. (laughs) <laughs> Whoa. So I want to create some space right now for us to share. I'm going to turn off my slides in a second, but to just give everyone an opportunity to share, like, what are some, like, as you look at that, and as you think about, like, what are the thoughts and the beliefs that you hold that you think might be impacting the way that you feel and then the way that you show up as a fundraiser? So what are some of the primary thoughts and beliefs that you hold as a fundraiser or as a nonprofit leader? And I just wanna give us a moment for me to stop talking and to hear kind of like what's in what's in the room. So I'm gonna stop my share and give everyone a chance to see each other and hear. And if you don't feel comfortable coming on camera or talking, please feel comfortable throwing it in the chat and you can send it to me anonymously and I will share it anonymously especially in this moment, there are causes that are more pressing than the one I'm fundraising for. Okay. So I have heard this a lot. I have heard this a lot. You are not alone and I'll, and I want to keep holding some space for folks to share, but let's talk about that for a second. Um, It's stressful asking people for financial contributions, especially when the inner workings are still being flushed out with the organization. Oof, I have been there and felt that one too. Um, Is this good enough to ask for funding around? Is this secure enough to ask for funding around? I feel a lot of pressure to be successful and perfect in my work because if I fail or if we lose long-time funding, it will negatively impact the mission and the colleagues who depend on the development department. Oh, I just want to say you fundraisers like development, like the weight on your shoulders. I think, you know, I talk a lot about fundraisers being like the unsung heroes that hold just so much um, pressure. So I just, I see that in that comment. Um, yeah, pressure to meet goals, pressure to prove impact and metrics. Another one is um, coming in to save the day, being too late, being hired too late to fix problems and then not being able to fix them. Mm. Curious, like what some of those problems are, Um, but I can relate to the sentiment, particularly as a fundraising consultant. I think we know that, um, that piece really well too. Yeah, starting to question where wealth comes from that is in turn funding our nonprofits. Ooh, so maybe some pieces around like gift acceptance policies are coming up for a lot of organizations right now. Are they aligned with the right partners, um, both individual, corporate, foundations? Um, I think maybe some of that is rooted in some of that as well. Yeah, fear of being grilled by the funder, donor, like the assumption that the work is not worth it. Yeah. Yeah, where the wealth comes from is a, is a big problem. Our donors don't have a sense of what might be wrong about their legacy of wealth. Yes, I'm definitely watching and having many of those conversations right now. Another one is uncertainty and worry about sustainability of funding streams. Hmm. And I, yeah, I so appreciate folks sharing and being vulnerable and saying some of those things out loud. And I I wanna just recognize first that even just the process of sometimes saying those things can be, um, can be, can lift a weight just a little bit to like say some of those things out loud to another development person, to your boss, right? To to have some of these conversations, to flush out before a donor meeting, okay, I'm worried I'm gonna get grilled about these things and to just like role play that out a little bit. I think so often, especially in smaller organizations where it's like single ED or three staff members or one development person, so much is held in 
um, because you're holding so much and you're maybe the only person who really gets the development function. Um, and so, and I think when all of those stories and all of those beliefs are being held within us, they, um, it is really hard to address the cognitive behavior loop there. So I'll tell you because many of the things that you said, if not every single one, is something I have thought or believed at some point. So I just want to, for a moment, dive into a few of them. Um, I hope that's okay. Uh, just to sort of show you like how I might challenge myself around, okay, if that discomfort is coming from this thought or this belief, is there a limiting belief there? Or is there a belief I can shift there to, to change ultimately how I feel around that one? So I wanna go first to the one about there being more pressing issues for funding, right? That belief is rooted in a deeper belief that there is only a set amount of funding in the nonprofit sector. But the thing about the nonprofit sector is it is not a market size. So it doesn't have to be either or this organization or that organization. And actually what we saw in 2020 was a dramatic increase in philanthropic giving that people weren't doing either or they were doing both and. And so if I was to, to you know, um, analyze my own belief there around, but there are other things that are more important. I think the deeper belief is like, do I believe that there's only a set amount of money in this sector? And is that belief true? Or can I shift that belief? Because if you truly believe that there, believe that there could be billions and billions of more dollars inside the sector, which I deeply believe, then that other belief doesn't sort of come in and play those games anymore, right? So I just, I wanted to pull out that example because sometimes the, the foundational belief that leads us to things like that is even maybe like one step um, further back. And so asking yourself sometimes when these beliefs or these thoughts are coming up, like, why do I believe that, right? Like, where does that belief come from? Um, and I see this comment about shifting scarcity mindset to one of abundance, which I love because we're going to talk about um, a framework that I use to sort of help you shift. I use a different term other than abundance, and I'll explain why. Um, but but I'm really excited that you that you brought that up. Um, and I want to I want to share. Sorry, I'm just looking at these for a second because there are just so many great. Um, great, great things that you guys said here that I totally relate to. Um, oh, the perfectionist piece. So I just want to address this one really quickly. So I have, I have had thousands of conversations with funders. And actually, there's a lot of research around this, not in the fundraising space as much as in the, not in the nonprofit fundraising space, as much as there is in like the venture capital fundraising space that sharing challenges, sharing um, kind of like the gaps in your product or service is actually a way to build deep trust with your funders. And this belief that we have about perfectionism, raising money is actually wrong. Um, and, and so like there is like tons of organizations have demonstrated this. I'm sure a lot of you demonstrated this last year in 2020, where you, as I said before, had to show up with more vulnerability to your donors and just sort of like, you know, um, create space to be more imperfect and then saw people step up in new ways. So that's definitely like, this is where kind of the additional questions really come into play. Like, why do I hold that belief, right? Like what's the data that supports that belief being true? Is there data to support a different belief being true? Just to start to disrupt that cognitive behavior loop. And I'm going to go, I could talk about, I, we could have a whole other conversation about this, um, but, I, but I'm looking at the time and recognizing that I can't do that. Um, but I just do want to sort of like, and you'll get the slides um, for this, of course, as well. But like this image is just always in my mind. And whenever I have that like 
cringy, awkward, uncomfortable feeling, I just go right back here. Like, what are the thoughts that are coming up that are making me feel this way? And then what are the beliefs that lie under that thought? And are they true? Like, are they actually true? And how can I get curious about what else might be true? Because any way that we start to disrupt this loop reveals tremendous possibility of other beliefs that we can take on, other thoughts that we can have, and then ultimately how we can feel different and show up differently. And I want to share one with you. I'm going to take a quick sip of water, sorry. Or not, sorry, because I'm a human and talking a lot. Um, <laughs> Um, but uh, trying to get better about, you know, apologizing for those very human moments. Um, so one of the big like thoughts and beliefs that I shifted that really fundamentally changed the way that I fundraise was this one. I believed for 13 years that fundraising was all about asking for something, that I was sitting there at that table and that the person across the table had the thing had the thing that I needed and I didn't really have anything, but I was asking and I felt guilty and I felt uncomfortable. And I felt like I was asking them to give me something that maybe they didn't even want to give me, but I was trying to talk them into it. And that was sort of what led to this, maybe, you know, projection of perfectionism, right? Almost like tricking them a little bit, right? That like, everything is great because I'm just going to convince you to give me this thing. And for me, a huge belief shift was that great fundraising is not an ask, it is an offer. It's about partnership and opportunity. It's about community and collaboration. I wrote this post on Instagram a while ago, like where I just crossed out the word, or I crossed out the sentence that said, it's for charity. And I just said, no, it's for addressing an issue that we both want to see solved together, right? So these are like the old frameworks that we hold, the old beliefs that we hold about what the nonprofit sector is, what um, investment in the nonprofit sector is. And so this was really one of the foundational beliefs that shifted for me that really sort of changed everything and, and helped me understand the power of the cognitive behavior loop. So as I mentioned a minute ago, you know, this this understanding of the cognitive behavior loop and then this shift for me about going from an ask to an offer helped me create this framework that I call um, funder mapping. Um, and inside funder mapping is something called asset mapping. I really should have come up with some more um, diversity and names there, but I did not. Um, and, uh, and so this, you know, someone made that comment about from scarcity to abundance, right? That like what, when we are holding scarcity narratives how does that impact what feels possible to us? And what I have found in my work is that it can be really difficult when folk, and do not worry about interpreting this whole thing, by the way, I'm going to give you access to another thing that walks you through all the steps. I'll explain it in a moment. Um, but what I have found in my work is that it can be really hard when folks um, when we're feeling a sense of scarcity to like make that shift to abundance. And I know we hear it a lot and I heard it a lot as a fundraiser, like feel more abundant. I was always like, okay, but like, I am real stressed about paying our bills, you know? And so like, how am I just going to like have this abundance mindset, you know? And Lynn Twist wrote a great book called The Soul of Money many years ago um, that talks about sufficiency mindset, which is sort of another, another framework around like when, when abundance feels hard to access sort of where do we go but for my work something I've created is this idea of asset mapping and so what this is is that is the understanding that your organization has tons of assets that surround your different program areas and surround your different um and and surround your organization as a whole so assets would be things like the number of um, you know, email subscribers that you have to your list, that's an asset, right? Thought leaders on your board of directors is an asset. The skills of your um, staff members that maybe don't even relate directly to your program, those are all, every organization has assets, tons of them, but we haven't been asked to think about them before or to leverage them or to incorporate them into how we fundraise. And the idea here is that there's two pieces to this. 
One is that asset mapping, understanding the assets of our organizations, it does two things. One, it makes that offering for funders much clearer, right? Like what are we offering our funders, even whether that's to be, you know, I don't know, a part of a thought leader panel, for example, with our board members, because that's something that they have really wanted to figure out a way to break into, right? But the idea behind asset mapping, in addition to the fact that it allows us to connect with our funders in a new way, is that it shifts the way that we feel sitting down at that table around us just asking for something. So like when we talk about power asymmetries, right? Some of that is being created by the fact that we think that the person with the money is the only thing with something of value, right? And when, but when we understand assets and we understand the offers that we're making, we can actually disrupt that entire feeling. So this is a very asset mapping and funder mapping are very big concept at the end of this. Um, and so we sort of have this choice to like, do we really focus all the time there or do we, um, or do we, do we move on? And so at the end, you're going to get uh, the web address. I think malloryerickson.com slash free. I have a webinar that goes really into detail around asset mapping. So we're not going to do it here, but I want you to start thinking about like, what are the assets of my organization that maybe I haven't been thinking about in that way before, right? Like where is the, um, where are the different things that make our organization strong and that make me feel proud? And um, all of that stuff is gonna start to, is another way to start to disrupt that cognitive behavior loop. So, so another piece of why this idea of asset mapping, of thinking about the assets of your organization, what is the offering, what are the partnership alignment pieces, another reason why that's really valuable is because it does disrupt the old fashioned sort of guru focus on warm introductions, right? Okay, so we've all been taught in fundraising, like have your board members open their Rolodex and, um, you know, tell us who they have in their network who has money, right? Like, I mean, I've had that, I've watched that conversation happen so many times, right? But that is that is the prospecting strategy that is aligned with the donor centric, you know, fundraising based on wealth scores and unconscious bias. It really has nothing to do with actual alignment in trying to solve the, the problem or address the issue that your organization is trying to solve. So that is a really broken strategy. And a lot of, a lot of time has been wasted, I think, by nonprofits and myself included in so many ways, you know, trying to figure out how to use like wealth as the primary indicator of whether or not someone is going to give to your organization. Um, and it, it, it starts with the wrong piece, right? So asset, the, the idea behind asset mapping is that it leads with alignment, right? So it leads with alignment. Where are, how do the assets of your organization, what you're trying to do as an organization, how do those match up with the goals of the funder. And again, this is not in a donor centric way, like how do we make them sort of the center and the savior here? But it's like, how is there, how is what you're doing aligned with what someone else is also trying to do? And where can strategic partnership happen in full deep respect and of course with the community that is being served, right? There's so I'm speaking to, uh, all of you who have very different sort of structures of organization. So I'm trying to use kind of terminology that applies to everyone. But the idea here is that it is rooted in community centric fundraising principles, but with transparency around the alignment. Right. So before I, I think the nonprofit sector in general has been sort of underneath this cloud of um, 
I don't know, maybe cloud. Like, I'm like, what's the opposite of transparency, right? Like there's like all these things that we like can't say or do, or like, we're going to go on this listening tour and we're not going to say that we have any interest in money, but like the whole time we're going to be listening about money and right. And so this is really about like, when you understand the assets of your organization, when you understand how those align with different types of funders, you can just be a lot more transparent about these conversations because it's about addressing an issue or a challenge or solving a, a problem that you both are already trying to solve, right? In your different and respective ways. So um, let's talk about once you understand your assets, once you understand your, like how those align with different types of funders, how do you effectively engage your funders? So a lot of folks have probably heard this before, the like no like trust factor. This is like a big kind of teaching comes from marketing, right? But a lot of nonprofits have been kind of had this like drill down their throat, right? Your donors need to know, like, and trust you. And we've all been kind of like operating in this like no like trust, and yet it's still not really feeling that good. And so I want to sort of analyze the reason for that. A lot of times, and I like joke about this on my webinar, that we feel like the car salesperson, right? And so, you know, why does, I, when I first started to kind of like uncover some of these trends, I really asked myself, I was like, gosh, you know, why do I feel like a car salesperson? Like, what is that? And then I was like, why even do car salespeople make us uncomfortable? And when I asked myself that question, I was like, oh, I was like, well, we avoid going car shopping without knowing exactly what we want because we feel that discomfort, right? And the reason we feel that discomfort is because the car salesperson is focused just on what they want, right? Selling the car. And it feels to us like they want to sell the car no matter whether or not it's truly the right car for us. And that's what feels pushy and uncomfortable, right? And so this is what I was mentioning before, right? We've been taught to do this in our fundraising too, but even more subtly, which creates this awkwardness because you all are helpers in so many ways. That's why you're here in the nonprofit sector. You have strong helper energy and you have strong problem solver energy and visionary energy and all of these different things. But then you go into these meetings where you're pretending like you're just learning, you're just there to learn what they care about, but you have this underlying goal and you're listening for those cues and you know whether or not they're gonna give a bigger gift and it just feels really authentic or like, this is how I feel, I felt, right? And this is how my clients felt. And this is what perpetuates then one of the biggest issues actually around the lack of trust is this entire dynamic that we have been taught to do. <laughs> so I think 2020 actually in some ways kind of shook us out of this a little bit. And I wanna talk about what I saw in 2020. And I'm curious, we're gonna, we're gonna open this up again in a moment. Um, or I actually, I might put you in breakout groups. How many folks do we have in here? Okay. Um, to uh, to talk about this a little bit, but one of the things that we, one of the things that we saw in 2020 was like the nonprofit sector actually really building trust with their organizations and relationships with their organization in completely different ways, right? We saw people sharing real stories and, and building the no through like real time moments with the organization, right? And I mean like really know you, not like know that one student who had the best possible outcome from your program, right? But I mean like you let them really know you. They got to see your living room and your kids and your dog and they got to actually know the organizations behind the impact reports, right? And the people in them and the people in your, um, you know, in, in your communities in so many different ways. You built the like factor based on actual true vulnerability and organizations saw that that, oh my gosh, here I am showing up in all my imperfection and you like me more, you like me more, whoa, like being a full human, that worked. <laughs> <laughs> and then we saw this trust piece, right? Like sharing real challenges and walking funders, you know, watching funders step up and watching funders ask 
questions, right? And actually having that true connection. And I, I also love what I saw in the comments about putting, putting up boundaries and pushing back on unrealistic timelines. You know, something that I think happened in 2020 that I sort of watched was, was trust being put into organizations to address different issues. And, 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 you know, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, the chicken or the egg, like, I, I think that organizations did have the, um, the sort of like strength and resolve probably partially caused by these kind of like desperate times to be like, no, actually, this is the actual way for us to do that thing. Or no, we do need more time to do that thing. And, and I'm sure that funder relationships were, you know, um, you know, maybe there were, there were breakups in the process in certain, in certain areas. But I also think a lot of and saw a lot of organizations watch their funders stand up like step up and say okay yeah tell me then tell tell us like what do you need and what does that look like and how and so really to just sort of call that in you know that you can and to say and i know this is a scary thing that i'm going to say but like you can outgrow your donors. The thing about finding true alignment, and I don't just mean like, you're all like, yeah, we know we can outgrow our donors, but I mean like you can let them go too. The thing about focusing on true alignment and that asset alignment and mission alignment and value alignment, when you combine all of those things, the idea is that you are building these authentic relationships with the folks who are gonna ebb and flow with you so that you can let go of those old relationships that are no longer in alignment. And for many of you, you serve in work for run organizations where you have shifted maybe your values or your statements about certain things yourselves or the way you run volunteer programs, right? That's a huge thing coming up right now for a lot of the organizations I serve, like really taking a deep look at their volunteer programs and being like, uh-uh, like this is not serving the community we serve. And yet our funding stream has historically relied on it. How do we shift those things, right? And it does require these, these deep and vulnerable and authentic conversations. Um, and so I want to encourage, uh, for those of us who like peaked our tortoise heads out of the shell in 2020 to have these, like, let's stay, let's stay out there, right? Because actually we watched it work from a fundraising perspective. There was this op-ed recently about, you know, are people sort of questioning whether community-centric fundraising works, but we've watched it work. We are watching it work. And I'm gonna share an article at the end of this too with three great examples if you're dealing with board pushback there around, um, around how organizations are shifting the way that they fundraise and seeing true um, and sustainable success. And so I want to offer one other kind of piece of the of the framework here, which is that um, is that so as I mentioned before, like there's this no like trust factor, right? And around sort of vul vulnerability and authenticity in that. The other thing that I recommend for folks, and I really want to like tease this apart really quickly, is around sort of like putting yourself in the shoes of your funder, okay? And I think a lot of times we we like look at this in a very black and white way where we're like, well, that's, that's the donor centric model. And no, that's actually not what I'm talking about here, but I want to show you a different way to think about creating funder alignment that is rooted deeply in your principles, your values, what you're trying to do, but also includes them in an authentic way, just like you would build any other relationship, right? Any other deep relationship. So the, the way I talk about this inside my programs is what I call lenses, right? So that, you know, in as the folks inside the nonprofits, we are often wearing blue lenses and our, our foundations are wearing green lenses, our corporate funders are wearing red lenses, our individual donors are wearing yellow lenses or probably a bunch of different colors. And oftentimes we speak to them through our blue lenses, through our perspective and all of the stories and all of the information and all of the data that we hold in the way that we view our organization. 
And we are missing something there by not putting ourselves in their shoes for a second and just viewing our organization and our work and our mission through their glasses, right? This does not mean putting them at the center of your organization, but looking at your organization through their glasses. And when we can talk to them through their perspective, right, based on that alignment and based on us showing up with our embodied in our assets and our offerings, we can actually have these more real conversations about the movement of money. I talk a lot about the movement of money. I know transaction is a very like unliked word in the nonprofit sector, but I also think that's a little bit of a limiting belief, right? Like transactions do not, are not always bad things, right? Like when people buy a house, that's an amazing transaction, right? Like we have just sort of adopted that language in the nonprofit sector to be a really negative thing. So I talk a lot about like money movement, right? Like how do we move more money into the sector? How do we move more money into your organizations? And the ways to actually be able to talk about money movement in sustainable partnership oriented ways is to give yourself that moment to put on your funder lenses and to talk to them through those. Any questions or thoughts about that piece in particular? Like what it looks like or how it works to sort of put on funder lenses. Can you share an example, Mallory? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so, okay, let me think about a good example here. Um, so oftentimes, like one of the organizations I work with does um, diabetes education and advocacy. And for a long time, they were reaching out to, um, to foundation partners, really talking all about diabetes, the epidemic of diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes and, you know, pre-diabetes and the disproportionate impact of diabetes on certain communities. But foundations in general do not fund disease specific areas, particularly in diabetes, right? Like if you look at the number of foundations that support diabetes, specifically, there's like two or three, really, right? It's not like cancer or things like that. But there are tons of foundations supporting health equity work and the beliefs that those foundations held about how to improve health equity or what the social determinants of health were and how they wanted their foundation to be a key player in improving those things totally aligned with the programs of this diabetes organization, right? But they were just hitting this wall because from the foundation's perspective, they were like, we don't do diabetes, right? They're like, why are you sending me one more email about that diabetes like think tank thing? Like we don't do diabetes, right? Because the foundation couldn't see everything that was behind that, you know, that sort of like topic barrier. But once the organization could reach out talking about health equity, talking about the disproportionate impact of diabetes on certain communities and how their program areas impacted the actual like deeper goals of that foundation, what that foundation was trying to do, they, they could find that alignment, right? And so I think sometimes in the nonprofit sector, we are so deeply embedded in our work, obviously, right? It makes total sense. But we have a hard time kind of like pulling out and being like, okay, how, what are the different entry points to funding for this work? And how can we talk to people from their, from their entry point to help them understand the connection, right? To really like kind of bridge that gap between the different color lenses that we're wearing. Um, and I think, I think, um, yeah, <laughs> that it's basic relationship building, of course. But I think what we ought, we often forget this piece because we feel so deeply about our work that I think sometimes we forget how much um, like information we're holding that a new a new funder like can't access right away. So when we can help speak to them in what's keeping them up at night it helps them come like have that conversation so much more easily. You know, the first emails that I recommend folks send to set up meetings with funders are like, hey, so-and-so, 
I just saw this thing you did about blank. I'm so inspired by the way you're investing in X, Y, and Z. Over here at Blank Organization, we are actually working on the same problem. I'd love to have a quick conversation about how we could come together in strategic partnership to achieve our shared goal of blank, right? Like that is such a different sounding outreach than like a, some big email all about your organization through our blue lenses, right? That makes it really hard for them to sort of like access and tap into. Okay, so I want to create some space. Uh, oh, how is this different than knowing a donor's linkage, ability, and interest? So I'm not exactly sure. I, I think maybe what you mean by linkage is like their connection to the organization. So I think that the, so I think that the big difference here is that one is that when you do this asset mapping piece and you use those lenses, actually, like oftentimes what I see with linkage is a strong, strong focus on warm introductions, right? Or, or like a warm connection using, talking about assets and talking about things through the lenses of these funders makes cold outreach really easy, really easy. And the other thing about it is that you know, you are like, one is that I think the other thing we don't realize around interest is that we aren't opening up conversations earlier in the process, right? So sometimes when we prospect too much within that framework, as opposed to saying, hey, I see them over there working on the same issue that we're trying to address over here. And I think they'd be really interested in the fact that we have X, Y, and Z as assets within our organization. We can go into a more fluid conversation, right? I think one of my big recommendations is that folks have conversations with funders before everything is all flushed out, whether it's for an event or a program or any of those things, because in that partnership, one buy-in is going to be created. You're going to learn a lot more about their interest than you do from their website, right? From just kind of their like overarching mission on their website. And so it's not that it's different necessary, necessarily from like linkage ability and interest. It's just plus, right? Like just plus, like the assets are a different component to add into that conversation and to not feel like if you don't have clarity on one of those things, that it's not worth the conversation. I hope that is helpful. Okay, I wanna just wrap up with some takeaways, some resources, and then answer any other questions that have come up. So, you know, the, the sort of like overarching pieces here are number one, going back to the very beginning, is around awareness, right? How is how you are feeling impacted by beliefs and thoughts and how can those be shifted? Like, what are the questions you can ask yourself? Just start to bring some awareness to that. Like every time before I'm gonna jump on a donor call or write an email and I feel that hesitation, I'm like, okay, where is that coming from? Like, what's the thought there? What's the belief there? And can I get curious about it? Is it really true, right? So even just the process of bringing awareness to that is gonna, is gonna open up a lot. Um, within your fundraising process. Then the second piece here is around identifying the assets of your organization and how those assets appeal to and connect to different types of funders, right? So different assets of your organization are going to be attractive to foundations versus corporate partners versus individuals, right? And once you really understand those um, you're going to be able to make that outreach a lot more clear, a lot faster. And that the webinar I mentioned, that's where I'll go into the all the steps of the funder mapping process, including asset mapping in more detail. We just couldn't dive into all of it today. I also will share maybe in the follow-up email, I just wrote a blog actually that walks through all of like asset mapping in a ton of detail with examples. So we'll get that shared in the follow-up. I'm sorry, I forgot about that. Um, so we'll, so we'll get that out to you. So that's number two, right? So asset mapping three is like alignment. So once you have this awareness, awareness, once you understand your assets, really being able to put on those lenses and align with your donors so that you can have authentic 
embodied, vulnerable conversations. When you know that that alignment is there and you understand the assets of your organization, you're going to show up to those conversations totally, totally, totally differently, right? And that's some of like taking that learning, that like tortoise head outside of our shell from 2020 and being able to stay there because there is that deep alignment around building these strategic partnerships that are a more sustainable funding stream, revenue stream for your organization. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, there are so many pieces that surround this, right? Like there are so many um, sort of like themes and topics that we quickly, uh, we didn't even address, right? We're sort of just referenced, honestly, throughout this training. And so what I really wanted to highlight are some of the other resources that are out there to help you build authentic vulnerable, asset-focused, even though people don't use that term, but a lot of times they're still, um, you know, teaching something similar, models to create sustainable fundraising for organization. There are two really under community-centric fundraising, which I'm sure a bunch of you have already heard of. There are two articles in particular. You'll get the slides with all these links, but that I think are really, are really important. The Fundraiser's Bill of Rights, rooted collaborative and just really everything Kashana Palmer does. Um, amazing, amazing. Um, you know, learn, connecting the cause provides so many resources around volunteerism um, and like how to dismantle the old school volunteer sort of, um, I don't know if strategy is even the right word, but the way we sort of, the nonprofit sector and volunteerism were, were born into each other. The next thing on here is actually my, it's not, I did not create it, but I use it. It's a speaker writer for meaningfully inclusive events. So anytime I'm asked to speak at something, I send folks this and it's actually like in my intake form and it um, shows like my expectations for them in terms of creating a meaningfully inclusive event. And if they want me to speak, they have to hit at least six out of the 10 things on this list. And it's also great if you are planning an event yourself um, to look at the, uh, the 10 really kind of basic components to this. Um, it is really helpful. Um, Jasmine Fain is a, is a good, is a friend of mine and just an amazing um, fundraiser and advocate and does a lot around fund sustainable fundraising outside of grants. I really encourage you to find her on, um, on Instagram too. If you already followed me, her and I did a live recently and I share her stuff all the time. So you can probably find her pretty easily through me. Um, and then Kindred Leaders is a, an, a really cool um, kind of small shop consulting firm talking about like, what are, what are all the old school ways we've been taught to be leaders and the, um, the really like disempowering um, structures and systems that need to be rewritten. Um, and they're often providing some great free support. Um, as I mentioned before, this is the webinar, how to raise more by getting in front of the right donors without hounding them. Um, this is where I talk about kind of asset mapping. And at the end, I talk about power partners, which is where all the concepts we talked about today come from. Um, all the ways to get in touch with me. I think these have been put in the chat along the way as well. We will send you an email after this with the recording, the transcript, Mallory's deck, the resources from today, all of the ways that you can get in touch with Mallory, Heather, and myself. Mallory, I, I just want to say to you and each of you who joined today to our fantastic disruptors, thank you so much for the work that you do, for being, as uh, Jennifer, I think, called it, frontline fundraisers and being there on the front lines and, and doing the work that really needs to um, happen for capacity building, for being a conduit for all the great impact work that y'all are facilitating. Um, we so appreciate your wisdom, Mallory. You're such a dream. Seriously, the work that you are in service to is so important. Um, a lot of people I know had to drop off before the end of the hour, and we're so grateful for you holding this space. Um, we are so grateful for you. Thank you for your time. As you all may know, this is a volunteer effort on all of our parts. And so if you'd like to make a gift to help us pay our speakers and cover the cost for what it takes to put on each episode, please do so at opencollective.com slash possibility project. We so appreciate your support and your backing. Um, and just want to highlight a couple of the topics that we're going to talk about next for possibility project. 
Um, this has been a special workshop that we have decided to launch in season two. Other topics that we're going to talk about and other workshops are going to include activism and equity, lessons learned from the South, how it can shape the entire US, uh, change in philanthropy and unrecognized philanthropy, um, especially with giving circles, and then Black excellence. How do we center joy, Black power, and prosperity? So stay tuned for more disruptive topics and just want to shout out to all of you and again to Mallory. Thank you so much for doing all of the good work that you do. and being with us today and take good care. Thank you for having me so much and, and, and spending this time with me and for all you guys do at Possibility Project to have these hard, real, big conversations and let, let us have these, these moments of um, connection. So thank you, thank you. Definitely. All right, take care y'all. Have a great day ahead, a good week and let's take care of each other. <laughs>